All right, let's take a look at a type confusion vulnerability in Apple's kernel. So the iPad OS, iOS, Mac OS, TV OS kernel XNU, X is not Unix, is based on the mock microkernel originally created at Carnegie Mellon University. Now a microkernel is an operating system design paradigm where they basically try to make sure that as much of the code as possible runs outside of the kernel and only the bare minimum runs inside the kernel. And while that's a good design in theory, and it certainly would be good for security if you have the majority of the code outside the kernel, for performance reasons, and Apple says this explicitly in their documentation, uh, they don't actually run all of the components outside of the kernel. But what they also say in the documentation is that they did keep the mock interface design because that allowed for a modularity that you couldn't get if you were designing for sort of a monolithic kernel where you expect everything to be all just compiled as one big blob of code, like a sort of Linux kernel, for instance. So by taking a design where everything is supposed to be created in a generic way for doing communication between chunks that are potentially outside of the kernel, by having that design, it allows for a much more modular construction. Now, there's a whole bunch of terminology from Mach that I'm going to have to introduce you to if you're going to make any sense of the source code that you're going to look at in a little bit. So in Mach, first of all, what you normally think of as a process is called a task. And within a task, just like within other operating systems processes, there are many threads. So in this picture, this big blue box is the task, and inside of that task there are many threads of code execution. Now in order to achieve that modular design, Mach is built around inter-process communication, which is achieved by a thing that they call a port. Now ports are unidirectional messaging interfaces. So basically you get messages or you get notifications you get different types of information in, but it is a one-way communication. So if a task wants to talk to another task, it communicates via port. And if this task wants to reply back, it needs to communicate via a different port. Now ports have access control on them, which are called writes. And the right to communicate with the port can be granted by one task to another task if the task itself owns the port or has the right already. So basically, if you think that like there's task one and task two, and task one wants to say, hey, task two, you can communicate with me, it can actually send over the right to task two uh, via something like a message, or it can just call a function like mock port insert right, and that'll say that this other task has the right to talk to the first task. Now, again, it could be messages or it could be function. We're going to look at the function in this case, but you know, if you had a port with messages, there's these message queues and they just get consumed from them and it would just process like, oh, here's a message saying that, you know, this other port is giving me the right to communicate with it. So the main point that I wanted to make here is that rights can be passed around. Now there's a variety of user space APIs that can be used directly to interact with this port system in Mach. So you can use it to create new ports, you can send messages to other ports, you can assign those rights between tasks, that kind of thing. Now, when you're looking at the code, you're going to see some references to spaces, and space refers to a port namespace, and a port's namespace is a list of port rights. So you can kind of think of the namespace like it's holding all of these rights, and it's kind of like an access control list of like, here are the rights that this particular task has, uh, and essentially the capabilities. And when I say that it's a list of named port rights, a name is just a number in a 32-bit space. So to make all of this a little bit more concrete, I just wanted to show you some output from a macOS utility ls mock ports, lsmp. And if I list the mock ports for Google Chrome when it's running on my system, then I can see that the name is basically just some integer in a 32-bit space. The IPC object, the inner process communication object, is sort of backing objects for this information. The writes you can see in this column, you can have send write, receive write, receive and send write. So those are the writes. And then just a bunch of flags and various things that we're not going to care about. So the thing we care about and is going to be relevant to this particular vulnerability is that names are just numbers. Uh, and, you know, these things can communicate with other things. I guess I wanted to say that, you know, Google Chrome, for instance, has mock ports and writes to communicate with, for instance, LaunchD, Open Directory D, LogD, CFprefsD. So again, these ports are basically an inter-process communication thing.
All right, and oftentimes mock ports are described as being an interface to a backing object. So the port is the channel for communicating, but the thing that you're communicating to, and the thing you're communicating to is a task, but the thing that it is representing, that this mock port is representing, can be thought of as an object. And so from Apple's documentation, so I'm just going to read this verbatim. A single task may have multiple ports that refer to resources it supports. For that matter, any given entity, and here entity probably means object, any given entity can have multiple ports that represent it, each implying different sets of permissible operations. For example, many objects have a name port and a control port, sometimes called the privileged port. Access to the control port allows object to be manipulated and access to the name port simply names the object so that you can obtain information about it or perform other non-privileged operations against it. Okay, so the reason I'm bringing this up is just to say that in some sense, although it's not, you know, although the XNU kernel is not written in like C++ as an object-oriented language, they still have a notion of objects, and that means that we can get into the same sort of trouble for type confusion amongst those objects that we see in other contexts. So the long and the short of all this background terminology is that in mock there are many object types, there are many port types, and there are many message types. Consequently, there are many opportunities for Tycho in mock, and there have been many vulnerabilities of this type. Yeah, you see what I did there? Okay, so this particular CVE is a Tycho that is caused by a race condition first, and there's an opportunity for many mock threads to interact in parallel if their mutual exclusion is not correctly enforced. So we said that, you know, there are APIs in user space, which code can call to directly interface with mock operations. And so you have multiple threads in user space, potentially calling different mock operations. If mutual exclusion is not in place, you can have a race condition, and that race condition can be used to set up type confusion. So as with other examples, I'm giving you some minimized code that'll be on the website for you to download the full code. And this minimized code is just a hint for where the most important bits are. And then the further hint is that since we said this is a race into a type confusion, the nature of the race is that you've got thread one, you've got function one and function four. And if attacker can interleave between these two functions, something happening on thread two, if there are two particular functions called on thread two, that can lead to a type confusion at the time that you get to this function four. So your job is to look at the code, try to figure out what function one and function four are, where does the attacker want to interleave some other calls, and then you need to figure out, you know, what are these particular calls. And I'm giving you this hint because it felt like, you know, just with no familiarity with this code, this would be probably uh, not feasible for you to find a particular vulnerability if I didn't, you know, give you all the way to this hint. But even still with this hint, because there's so much, you know, unfamiliar terminology, this could still be a medium to difficult level challenge. But go ahead and go get the code and try to find the flaw.